This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. The late Joel Schumacher's 1999 neo-noir 8mm is not exactly the film it was meant to be. It was written by Andrew Kevin Walker, who was looking to follow up his previous noir thriller 7 with a story about a private surveillance investigator becoming immersed in an underground illegal pornography ring where he attempts to prove the existence of a snuff film. However, according to some sources, the studio wasn't too keen on Walker's brutal depiction of violence and sadism, and sought for a more accessible approach compared to the gruelling nihilistic tone of Seven. In a 1999 interview, Walker stated that he basically disowned the film after Schumacher changed large portions of the script to supposedly lighten the overall tone, which went against Walker's self-defined cinema of discomfort, which instilled that not every story has to have a happy ending. Yet, while I sympathise with Walker's understandable frustrations, I believe 8mm to be among Schumacher's best and most underappreciated films, as I think it still captures Walker's powerful intent for soul-shaking grimness, while adding a few thoughtful, alleviating touches that give further emotional complexity to the story than simply a perpetual cycle of misery. Schumacher smartly navigates 8mm's provocativeness with a tasteful visual style that doesn't depend on showing much on-screen violence violence, as it famously only ever shows glimpses of the snuff film, instead placing the focus almost entirely on the rawness in Nicolas Cage's performance. I've mentioned it before, but it was a fairly influential stylistic choice that later became prominent in other films, such as another Sony Pictures releasing film called Vacancy, which I covered a few months back, and bluntly speaking, you have 8mm to thank for all the best parts in Sinister. The film works best when it keeps you firmly in the anxious shoes of investigator Tom Wells, as he goes from being a safe, distant observer to actively involving himself in a world completely outside his comfort zone. I will get into spoilers once I put everything into context, but as always, I want to engage more with what exactly Walker wanted to tell with this story, as it does take many familiar thematic cues from Seven, but on paper, you might even see that 8mm could arguably be a far bleaker film. But while we're on the topic of protecting yourself from the big bad monsters of the world, nothing distresses me more than finding out anyone knows more about me than I allow, especially when that information is being exploited. This can include hackers obtaining emails and passwords, power hungry companies selling your data for disgusting profit, or your internet service provider logging everything that you do, including that <coughs> porn that you watch. Without ExpressVPN, it's like hiking up a rocky mountain and realising you forgot to wear your favourite cosy socks. Yeah, you can still climb it, but your feet are going to make you scream bloody murder for the next few days. It's just not worth the pain and suffering that comes with being unprotected. Yet, with ExpressVPN, not only do you get that safe, secure goodness during your online adventures as they mask your IP address and encrypt your data so that it makes it more difficult for people to track your online activity, but they provide you with permanent peace of mind. ExpressVPN does not secretly log any of your data due to their ethically audited trusted server technology, which means all their servers run on RAM and thus cannot store data, and it wipes all traffic upon every reboot. I use the internet every single day, and I've taken it for granted more times than I care to admit, so I do sincerely encourage you to check out ExpressVPN for yourself and take back control of how you freely and safely use the internet without fear. Find out how you can get three months free by visiting expressvpn.com slash Ryan. What initiates Tom's journey is when he's hired by a wealthy widow simply called Mrs. Christian due to his adherence to his client's confidentiality to investigate a mysterious film discovered in her recently deceased husband's private safe that supposedly shows the graphic murder of an unidentified girl. To us, it's obviously a snuff film, but Tom initially refutes it as a work of extreme fetishized fiction and begins by examining the footage to uncover details that will lead him to the ultimate truth. What makes it such an unnerving watch is how it grinds the snuff film within such a mundane, ordinary setting, while keeping the specifics of the film itself largely mysterious until Tom can verify its authenticity. 
I mean, it isn't really a surprise when Tom eventually discovers the diabolical monsters behind it, but I do like the element of doubt that Reg really comes up when Tom struggles to find another snuff film in the illegal markets across LA. At first, there is something enigmatic about it, because even the sleaziest and sadistic of illegal sellers reject snuff as nothing more than an urban legend, and the imported content Tom does find is completely fictional, validating his original suspicion if indeed it is still incredibly distressing to watch. This isn't really a spoiler, but going into it, I always thought Tom was going to be investigating multiple snuff films, yet it's actually just the one, or at least the only one we know of, which I guess further heightens the sense of realism because to get access to something this hellishly depraved likely requires a very substantial amount of power, wealth, and connection. Before Tom enters the illegal underground, we actually spend a fair bit of time getting familiar with Tom's peaceful, humble home where he lives with his caring wife and baby daughter, far removed from the dangers of the big city. It helps instill this theme of innocence that becomes lost as Tom's investigation continues. It's conveyed not only through the victims and good people he meets along the way, but also himself, who you could say is the opposite to Morgan Freeman's apathetic detective in Seven. Tom is a man with a hopeful and moral outlook on the world, and channels that energy through his family despite the cynical and immoral things he witnesses while working to expose cheaters, liars and the corrupt as the cold opening suggests. He has this stern, stable, unflinching composure that allows him to emotionally disconnect from his work while remaining sensitive to his emotionally fragile clientele. We see two very distinct sides to Tom, one lovingly devoted to his family, and the other professionally focused on completing the job at hand. However, this composure doesn't last for long, because after being left physically petrified by the snuff film, he returns home and just stares at his daughter, inferring to his fear for the terrible things he hopes not to be true, as he wishes for his daughter not to grow up in a world filled with the nefarious monsters he's ultimately about to encounter. As a husband and father, that need to protect his loved ones becomes even more urgent, and to bring back a constant sense of levity and normality, Tom calls his family on regular intervals, only to lessen communication when he sinks deeper and deeper into the hellish abyss. The symbolism it displays is a world of saints and sinners, and once Tom gets a taste for how evil the world can truly be, he begins to transform and deteriorate from calm and composed to emotional and desperate, eventually tapping into his own inner violent self, another side of him he never knew existed. And all of this is displayed through impressively detailed visual storytelling, as Tom changes from simple suits to dressing in black, and the lighting switches from soft to harsh, cemented further in a simple statement from Tom's underground navigator Max California, played by Joaquin Phoenix, who warns Tom about how easy it is to be consumed by this illegal world. You dance with the devil, the devil doesn't change, the devil changes you. You get turned on at places like tonight? No, I am not. You don't exactly get turned off either. Devil's changing you already. Early in his search, Tom learns that the girl in the film is called Mary Ann Matthews, and travels to North Carolina to interview her mother Janet, who lives out each passing moment hoping for her daughter's return after running away to LA to seek a better life. This is the most profoundly heartbreaking scene, and is significant to establishing Tom's transformation because when inspecting her daughter's room, it visually reminds us that she was just a child, further reflecting on Tom's fears for his own baby daughter and the preservation of innocence. After learning of the countless missing person cases that have been forgotten over the years, Tom does slightly break his composure, realising he is out of his depth, but shakes it off knowing that it is his job to find the absolute truth at any cost, and give closure to those seeking answers so they may heal, or at least that's what he hopes. 
Although, anticipating the worst, he asks Janna a question that sets the moral tone of the story. Would she rather continue believing her daughter is living her best life, or know the truth as unimaginably agonizing as it is? I would choose to know. I need to know. It is a very loaded question that digs into this idea that what we don't know won't hurt us, as Tom withholds information from both Janet and Mrs. Christian until he confirms that they truly wish to know what happened. By the end, Tom does his job as the inevitable bringer of bad news, but seeing the devastation left on the victims and the lack of justice, his fears transition into anger. And moving into the final third of the story, this is where Tom seeks the closest he'll ever get to closure. I'm going to press pause here because we are entering major spoiler territory, but it does consolidate everything I've talked about up to this point, so brace yourself. As we've established, 8mm is the story about a family man literally going out of his way to look for trouble, only to slowly realise that the monsters he's looking for aren't buried downwards, but up, which you think he would have suspected given the proprietor of the film was of course a powerful industrial tycoon. I think that's what the film is trying to tap into. The worst part is knowing that the evil could be anyone around us, as the villains don't actually blend in with the illegal markets or hide in some big secret conspiratorial lair lurking beneath the city. They are nefariously out in the open, in distant but plain sight, even to the point they follow Tom throughout his journey, and it all builds towards a revelation that's far simpler and nihilistic than you might expect it to be. So the reason I haven't talked about Joaquin Phoenix's character Max California is because I think he is the most wasted aspect of the film. Aside from being the most genuinely compelling character, just as Tom starts to see the same humble, well-intentioned and vulnerable person in Max that he sees in himself, the film just sort of moves on and never comes back to it. I'm not patronizing you. Well, thanks. Yeah. Alright, well you take care of Max California. You could argue that's the point because his nasty sudden death reinforces that Seven-esque bleakness that life doesn't always have a happy ending and good people will always end up in the crossfire. It's a shame because he is in a fair chunk of the movie before the bad guys are revealed, which includes James Gandolfini as the dirty talent scout Eddie Poole, Peter Stormare as a revered pornographic director called Dino Velvet, some guy in a mask simply known as Machine, and the Christian's lawyer who had the snuff film commissioned in the first place. I don't want to make light of the harrowing circumstances, but it's honestly exactly what I picture when I think of a ragtag team of humanity's most despicable men. It's just a perfect piece of sleazy, corrupted casting. This is a long day, and if there's no honor among perverts and pornographers, the whole fucking business would fall apart. The nihilistic revelation is that while Tom was expecting a deeper emotional reason to justify all the depravity he's witnessed, all he gets is this inconsequential, apathetic answer that these men simply do it because they can. Can't get your mind around it, huh? I don't have any answers to give. Nothing I can say is gonna make you sleep easier at night. As Velvet basically explains, they have no fear of consequence due to the confidentiality between them and their clientele. You can unfortunately see how this plays into real life. Christian was a rich, powerful man who was narcissistically gratified by his own untouchable status, and thus the snuff film can be interpreted as a sickening symbol of that dominance to do whatever the fuck he wanted. Why did he want a film of a little girl being butchered? Because he could. He did it because he could. Soon after, a fight breaks out when Tom exposes that the lawyer screwed over the producers in regards to payment by only giving them $50,000 out of the $1 million Christian gave him to split for the film. After Dino and the lawyer kill each other, Tom flees the scene instead of stopping the remaining two men, because after all, he's not a cop seeking justice, he's just a private investigator whose job is to seek answers, which he gets, regardless of how unfulfilling they may have been. Tom returns home and breaks down in tears, realising that he is no hero, and everything he did was technically for nothing, as all it did was hurt more innocent people, including Mrs. Christian who commits suicide upon receiving news of the evil doings of her husband. 
I think it was going for this idea that the world doesn't stop turning just because you find the truth. Evil people still exist and will keep doing evil shit. Simply put, there is no catharsis to these discoveries, just more pain and bloodshed. Instead, Tom decides to seek retribution himself and shows a completely different side to his character when he calls Marianne's mother and asks for her permission to hurt the man who killed her daughter. This need for permission plays precisely into Tom's challenging philosophy right from the very beginning and that specific need for closure. He wants a reason to shatter his own morality to return the same suffering back to those who took innocence away from this world. With this consent, Tom viciously beats Eddie to death and travels to New York to confront Machine, the mysterious masked man who committed the physical murder. The surprise here is that Machine, whose real name is George, is just some ordinary guy living a life outside his crimes, not that much different from Tom, and even cares for his elderly innocent mother, again showing us that the evil sometimes comes from those who simply live around us. George's final monologue sees him bluntly mocking Tom for trying to find any more reason in his motive. There's no psychological damage or history of abuse, George does it because he likes it. Once the men are dead and it's all over, Tom isn't left any better by it. He still hasn't achieved any true sense of closure. He walks away feeling deflated and returns home and breaks down in front of his wife, asking her to save me. 8mm walks a line between wanting to give its audience narrative closure while still retaining that moral uncertainty, and I deeply respect how Schumacher juggled all these witty themes without undermining Walker's story. Hell, it takes a sincere understanding of the script to embed all these additional elements of hope. It still leaves you in discomfort at how venomous the world can be, but I really love Schumacher's final edition, where Tom receives a letter from Marianne's mother thanking him for showing her that goodness still exists. It sparks a hopeful smile from Tom, suggesting that while he was left scarred by his ordeal, as were many others, he's at least received some confirmation that the truth can still one day lead to healing. 